All right, guys, let's do it. We're going to have the conversation about Jordan Neely and ask ourselves, is this the new George Floyd? Let's get into it. What's up, guys, and happy Friday. Welcome to Unapologetic. I'm your host, Amala Epinobi. We have Taylor in Nashville. Feliz Cinco de Mayo. <laughs> <laughs> and we have Scott in the Producers Bay. Hey, what's up, everyone? All right, guys. I hope you're having a fantastic Friday. Let me know your weekend plans in the chat down below. Today, we're going to have a conversation about the newest media headline that is creating hysteria and yet another call for the, I guess... A reiteration of Black Lives Matter, protests in the streets, people shouting, say his name. And that is the name Jordan Neely. This is a story out of New York City where on a subway, a man aged 30 uh, was choked to death by bystanders on this subway because he was apparently having some sort of mentally ill, psychotic, maybe drug-induced episode on the subway. We're gonna first listen to this news story before we get into commentary on the issue. The video shows three strap hangers subduing the 30-year-old man after witness Juan Alberto Vasquez says he got on the northbound F train and began acting aggressively, threatening riders. Law enforcement sources with knowledge of the case confirm his account, saying according to a witness, the man began shouting, quote, I want food. I'm not taking no for an answer. I'm ready to go back to jail, and I'll hurt anyone on this train. The man got on the subway car and began to say a somewhat aggressive speech, saying that he was hungry, he was thirsty, and he didn't care about anything. He didn't care about going to jail, that he didn't care that he gets a big life sentence, and it doesn't matter if he died. Vasquez says he was scared and believes others on the train were too. That's when he says a 24-year-old rider came up behind the man and put him in a chokehold, holding him there on the ground. Two other men standing over them also helped subdue the man. If there was fear, the people who were bluish or who were there, where he separated everything, moved from their place. I stayed sitting in my place because it was a little further away. But obviously those moments, well, one thinks fear, one thinks he may be armed. Now, there's the story. So you have 30-year-old Jordan Neely, who was apparently having some sort of episode on the subway, shouting that he wanted food, that he would do whatever was was necessary to uh, be placed in jail. He didn't care if he lost his life. Uh, he did not care who he hurt, according to eyewitness testimony in regard to this. And apparently a, a veteran of some sort, I think an ex-Marine, got up, started to subdue Neely by choking him. And two other men came to his aid to also uh, sort of stop this hostile behavior from happening and subdue this man as well. So this encounter, I believe, from the starting of the choking to the end of it lasted 15 minutes and Jordan Neely did not survive. There's a lot to unpack here. But what was really interesting to me was when this story came out, it wasn't necessarily a story about mental health. It wasn't necessarily a story about homelessness, which apparently 30-year-old Jordan Neely was experiencing in New York City. It immediately became a race story because the first man to subdue him and place him in that chokehold was a white man. And that's the uh, the Marine that I was telling you about. So this narrative comes out of this is the a racial uh, instance of a, a lynching, some have even said, of Jordan Neely on the subway train because a white man did it. I do wanna point out in this video that there's two other men subduing him, which we talked about. One of those men is black. And for some reason that's not being reported on by the news and mainstream media. So first I just wanna get rid of the racialized narrative that is being spun, not only by mainstream media, but by our, our Congress people, our representatives, and people who are trying to spin this story into something that it's not. Now, does me saying it's not about race completely alleviate all sense of fault or guilt from the person who put him in this chokehold? No, but we need to talk about the dynamics of that situation too. Do I think that personally a 15 minute chokehold is probably too long for this instance, especially when you have two other men who are helping you to subdue this guy? 
yes, I, I do think that is too long. But you also have eyewitness accounts of people saying, well, he continued to move, he continued to fight, he continued to act like he was going to get up and do something. So at that point, I think the waters become really murky and really muddy when we're talking about this. I just want to get rid of the race narrative right out of the bat. And in order to do that, we need to address some of the people who are spinning that narrative. One of those people is Ayanna Presley. She tweeted this out. Uh, he was 30 years old. Black men deserve to grow old, not be lynched on a subway because they were having a mental health crisis. Jordan deserved better accountability now. And alongside that, she tweeted out a video of Jordan Neely uh, doing a Michael Jackson impression on the subway. Let's watch a quick clip. All right. So, yeah, I mean, a, a talented young man was doing a, a Michael Jordan impression. I mean, Michael Jordan, Michael Jackson impression on the subway. I do want to reiterate that is not what he was doing at the time of this incident. And uh, this sort of tweet like this paints the picture that this is what was going down on on the subway. That was not what was happening. He was th making threats towards people and saying he did not care what happened to him or what he did to others. Are we to expect that nobody in your community stand up to do something when somebody is acting that way on public transit and has the ability to possibly hurt others. As the young, uh, as the uh, eyewitness said on that news clip we watched, we didn't know if he had a weapon on him. We didn't know what he was gonna do. And he was certainly talking as if he was going to do something horrible. Would you not want a strong man to stand up and do something in that case. Now, again, I'm not saying that 15 minutes was the answer. Choking this guy for 15 minutes and, and subsequently having his life taken due to that is the answer. I'm just saying, what else is one meant to do when something like this happens? Are they supposed to allow him to just go on a rampage through this subway car, which apparently this man was notorious for? They're now going into his record and saying, not only is he like an infamous fixture of the New York City subway because so many people have had, you know, bad encounters with this guy where he's threatening them or assaulting them. He also has 44, uh, 44 uh, arrests on his record. 44. That's a lot to gather up by the age of, of 30. And it signals to me that maybe you are not this great fixture of light in your community that is making people's days better just by doing your Michael Jackson impression on the subway. Now, along Ayanna uh, Presley, alongside her came AOC tweeting out, I have yet to hear a real explanation from any official hesitating to condemn the killing of Jordan Neely about uh, what makes condemning this violence so complicated. Killing is wrong. Killing the poor is wrong. Killing the mentally ill is wrong. Why is that so hard to say? Neely's last words were literally about how going to jail was easier than accessing the social safety net support to get back on his feet and lead a life yet leaders want to raise his record as if that warrants a public execution on the subway. What have we come to? And there is a point to what she's saying here. Of course, we're, we're not trying to go around killing the poor or killing the mentally ill. And I would have hoped that there would have been better structures set in place so that this instance never happened, so that you didn't have a homeless guy who's experiencing some sort of mental episode on the subway terrorizing people in the first place. But that's what happened. And for a democratically run city that has had constant conversations about defunding the police and all of these different things, it's no wonder these sorts of accidents, and that is what it is, I don't think anybody was going on the subway intending to kill somebody that day, these sort of accidents occur with that sort of rhetoric running around your city. Does that not seem to be a clear connection to everything that's been going on in our metropolitan areas? And I'm not hearing anybody sort of address that the left in itself has been advocating for community policing, right? When we defund the police and we get rid of law enforcement, community policing is the way that we would go about things. And that's the, the future of our, of our utopia. Is this not maybe what community policing looks like? Isn't that what happens when you put acts of police and in, in, in law enforcement in the hands of the community rather than in the hands of actual trained professionals and police officers? And 15 minutes is a long time to have to deal with somebody, uh, you know, throwing threats at people and saying he'll do anything and that he doesn't care about his life. What can happen in the span of that time? 
again, not to justify the whole act of, you know, choking him to the point of death. And I do find it a little hard to believe. We haven't heard testimony from the people who are responsible for this. I find it a little bit hard to believe that he was not, you know, unconscious sooner and that they couldn't have, you know, gauged that he was unconscious and maybe let go of him with three men all standing there. I think that's a point that has been missed on the right end of the spectrum when having this conversation. It's a little it's a little far-fetched to me to believe that he was just kicking, screaming, trying to threaten people for the whole 15 minutes that he was down on the ground. Does that clear things up? There's some other sort of, you know, left-wing rhetoric surrounding this and uh, seemingly a justification for the behavior of Jordan Neely and testimony that maybe people should just allow this to happen to them and that they should just go about their day while somebody is, you know, threatening abuse to them while they're trying to, I don't know, go to work, go home, travel throughout the city. Here is a clip from uh, the Majority Report with Sam Cedar, his podcast. Now, I don't know what this woman's name is. It's Emma Vigland. Emma Vigland. Okay. Let's hear what she had to say. Um, I, I was hit at one point sitting on the subway by a man who was having a mental health episode. He sat next to me and he was elbowing and kind of flailing around and hit, hit me in the face and in my body. And I, I it was jarring, right? Um, the idea that I, I would want him to be hurt in any way i just didn't want to be near him in that moment because mm -hmm. i understood something was going on here every one of us who's taken public transit has had this kind of situation ha something similar happen seeing someone struggling that doesn't mean that our fear in that instance and i was a little scared because i my i, I was hit it's a problem like it's but, people but, that but, need but help I would, but like my fear is not the primary Right. A primary uh, object of like what we should be focusing on right now. It's the fact that this person is in pain. Um, and so like the politics of dehumanization privileges the the bourgeois kind of concern of people's like immediate discomfort in what? this narrow, narrow instance, as opposed to larger humanity and life. It's really freaking twisted. Yeah, I just. Dude, what the bourgeois concern with what your own safety and oh my gosh, you know what? Yeah, the next time that you guys are on public transit or whatever and a homeless person or somebody who's mentally ill comes to attack you and is elbowing you and punching you in the face, just look at them and say, sir, I know how much you're struggling. Is there any way that I can help you with your, your struggle right now as they are quite literally assaulting you? Yeah, that's that's the answer. Ask them what you can do to to help their struggle. I get the underlying argument that she's trying to make that force should not be our first answer to this because they're experiencing mental anguish and there should be other safety nets set up for these people. And I'm inclined to agree up until the point that you're on the subway and the guy is threatening you or is punching you or is elbowing you in the face as she just talked about. Something needs to be done there. And no, I'm not going to let my own safety fall by the wayside while somebody is quite literally assaulting me. doesn't matter if it's a mental health episode, a drug, you know, a drug induced uh, attack. It does not matter. If somebody is attacking you for whatever reason, you have every right to try to subdue them and to stop them from hurting you. Ugh, what? Yeah, no one's arguing that anybody deserves to have be violence inflicted against them for no reason. Um, the argument is that you should be safe, that it shouldn't get to the point in which somebody is threatening you or or flailing in a way that is harming you. And you shouldn't be subjected to that as a citizen, nor should any citizen who's just trying to go about their day using uh, public transportation or whatever it may be, just living daily life. We shouldn't be subject to violence. No one's arguing that random acts of violence against uh, or unsolicited acts of violence against homeless people or mentally ill people is justified. We're only arguing that the violence that should not come to your doorstep um and that is not justified and so to to make the argument that i don't deserve safety is just such a strange way to frame this situation um and i don't know it just i guess shows the power of uh yeah i don't want to say your brain on leftism but just the the warped thinking that you have to have to say you know the the issue at hand when a person is threatening physical violence in a public place is not the person's threatening physical violence it's it's or it, it's it's my is not my safety it's uh right. their their mental health 
uh, in that situation. It's like if, if Jeffrey Dahmer is, you know, cornering his next victim and they're like, oh, well, I know you're having a, a mental struggle right now. So just, oh, this is really about you. It's not really about my safety. It's about, you know, what you're going through. I know you had a, a difficult past. And so let's, let's focus on that and, right. and you know, not my need for protection. It's just silly. It is absolutely silly. Yeah. Go, go tell the woman who's being abused by her boyfriend that he actually has some repressed traumas that she needs to go and figure out and ask him about his struggle the next time he hits her. That's that's how we solve it, right? That's how we get over this problem. And again, not the only one spinning this story. Here's CNN uh, tweeting, before Jordan Neely was killed on the New York City subway car this week, he was known for his swift Michael Jackson dance moves that entertained many, yet he struggled with the trauma his mother's murder had left him with at an early age. Interesting. Interesting. So he was known for his swift Michael Jackson dance moves, not necessarily the 44 arrests, not the prior assault of women on on uh, the subway cars, not just completely ruining the experience of people trying to go through public transit. And it's interesting that I seem a lot of the excuses made for this is just like, oh, it's New York City. It's public transit. That's what everybody goes through. You know, everybody has their little public transit story of a homeless person peeing on them or, you know, stealing food from their hands or assaulting them or robbing them and, and looting. Everybody has that experience, right? It's That's New York. I'm walking here. <laughs> Is that really the excuse that you get to use for something like this happening? And again, I'll say it again. I don't know that it justifies a 15 minute chokehold on this man. And I think that three men could have subdued him without going that far. But when you leave policing in the hands of communities and there is not a police officer there to attend to what is happening, what do you expect them to do? And yeah. had this situation ended differently, like had they held him in the chokehold and subdued him or whatever, and uh, the subway car stopped, it opened up and there's a police officer and they said, here, this guy is threatening to assault people. People would have been calling this guy like a hero. But because it went south, and obviously for uh, reasons that could be totally within his control, we're getting a far different story and a racialized story. It makes no sense. None. I don't know that I have anything else to say about this. Uh, but it seems to be a failure on the city's part to keep everything that's happening in their public transit in control and to keep police officers out there. I mean, the mayor of New York City, Eric Adams, is a former police officer himself. I mean, he should know about the infrastructure needed in, within law enforcement to stop things like this from happening. But yet the city continues to be overrun with these issues, much like here in L.A. And that's all I well, at what point do you think it's it falls the responsibility kind of falls on the people and who ultimately enable these politicians by voting for them to continue to implement these policies that uh, set the bar so low for the the level of criminality that is allowed in a community and that make it so unsafe um, and just implement these ineffectual policies. At what point does the responsibility kind of fall on you, the citizen, for continuing to put these people in power? Uh, because that that's where my mind keeps going when you really get down to it. Because we can point fingers at the you know the DA, we can point fingers at the politicians who right. ref, you know refuse to implement policies that actually address the mental health issues and homelessness and stuff like that. But at the end of the day, we the citizens are the ones that need to be voting for this. But that just seems to never register, and they just keep going voting the same way. Yeah, I mean there there is certainly a portion of the responsibility that lies within like with the constituents 100 percent because these people are running with this narrative they're telling you exactly what they're going to do they're telling you that they're they're you know not going to be tough on crime or that they're planning on rolling over you know these laws or changing this legislation in the name of restorative justice and like in california the, all the different discussions about zero bail policies and decriminalizing you know uh, shoplifting and all this different stuff they're outright telling you this is what i'm going to do and if we cannot start to make the connection that c comes after a plus b like i i don't i don't understand i don't understand and yeah, unfortunately and oh, go ahead. yeah just just horrible stuff like this is going to continue to happen especially if police officers are not there to respond uh when needed yeah and i i was poking around and i i you know this is obviously people are talking a lot about mental health in this situation and just homelessness and i was looking at uh, Michael Schellenberger's political platform, uh, when he the way he was proposing of um, solving California's homeless problem and dealing with mental health in the state, mm -hmm. and 
he models his approach after the Netherlands, where he's traveled and done a lot of research. Um, and they have a tough love policy. And it is, uh, you're not allowed to just live this lifestyle out on the streets. You're not allowed to consume drugs in the open air. You're, you, you are arrested and you're required to stay in a shelter. Um, and it, you know, this situation would have never happened if a policy like that were in place. And, the, and he says that there's like better ways you, they, ship people that are struggling with mental illness that need to be institutionalized to places that are lower cost of living. They get federal subsidies and support for that. And has, there are other ways, bottom line, to, to deal with this, but it starts with just acknowledging the reality that some tough love is needed and shielding criminals from the consequences of criminal behavior is only passing those consequences on to the public. And if that is the, the, that failure of people to realize that, whether they're politicians, whether it's the media or whether it's citizens, is just this massive disconnect that we can see the consequences of which playing out in our cities across America. And I, as until that, like, how bad does it need to get before we're at rock bottom or at a place where we're actually willing to do something about it, to, to change policies and to uh, implement policies that reduce crime once again. Right. Uh, this New York City is in a similar state to what it was in the 1980s. And there were examples back then of, of vigilante justice. And when you withhold, uh, when you create this culture of bystanderism, when you create this culture of, of police not being resourced enough or having their hands tied uh, to enact, uh, to, to address and confront crime, you're opening the door to vigilantism and you're opening the door to sticky situations like these where people are going to intervene uh, for themselves. And that that's that, there's a famous case, I think, Bernard Getz in the 80s who shot four men on a train who were trying to rob him. But it was during a time of, of very heightened criminality in New York City. And it's just history is repeating itself here. But it's like we know what it takes to address these issues. There just seems to be an unwillingness to do it. Right. And it's just and you can mix tough love with treatment with medical treatment. And that is yeah. precisely what uh, Michael Schellenberger talks about in, in his book. And I that, believe that's San Francisco, for those of you who want to uh, read it. And I, you know, for me, it begs the question, at what point is it not vigilantism anymore? Like, if there are no safety nets as far as actual law enforcement and police officers who are going to respond in a timely fashion when things like this are happening, at what point can you no longer be characterized as a vigilante? At what point are you just protecting yourself because nobody else is going to do it. Uh, and I don't know that that's the case here. I don't know when police officers got involved in this instance, if they were waiting when the subway car stopped at its final you know, destination or whatever. I don't know the ins and outs of this. But everybody should be asking themselves that question. If you're living in a city and you know if something goes down, I can not count on police officers to be there within, what, like five to ten minutes of you making your call. At what? You're no longer a vigilante, in my opinion. In yeah. my opinion, you're doing what what would have to be done in order to possibly save the lives of the people around you. And if somebody is talking crazy about how they don't care what it takes or they don't care if they lose their own life or how bad they hurt somebody else, what else are you meant to do? And we're looking at this story through the lens of grown men, but imagine there's like a little family on this subway train, on this subway car. What do you expect somebody to do when somebody's acting like that? Are they supposed, supposed to just wait and see what happens? I don't know. I certainly would not be waiting to see what happens there. But we'll update on this story. I'm sure there's going to be a wicked trial for this guy. Uh, and hopefully, you know, public opinion is not going to just sway and create an inability to even have a fair trial on something like this, because that very well could be the possibility. Uh, so we'll wait and see what happens. All I know is that this case is not uh, what it's being spun to be. It was not a racialized problem, but it certainly is a problem with mental health, community policing, uh, and lack of law enforcement. But uh, we'll keep you posted. Now, on to lighter news. <laughs> Let's break down what's happening at Barstool uh, right now. Recently, an employee by the name of Ben Mintz uh, was terminated uh, at Barstool, and he works on, I believe, one of their podcasts. Dave Portnoy posted a video on Twitter saying, emergency press conference, Ben Mintz has left the building, explaining the situation. And apparently, all of this happened because Ben Mintz, a white, male, heterosexual, 
decided to say the N-word, not in reference to another black person, not as a use of a, a derogatory slur aimed at another individual, but reading the lyrics of a rap song. Let's hear it. Okay, emergency press conference time. Uh, bad news. This sucks. So today we had to fire Ben Mintz, the artist formerly known as Ben Mintz. It stems from his wake up with Mincy. Ironically, finally got to do him live, and he was rapping uh, lyrics to a rap song, reading the words off his phone, and he said, and he rapped a racial slur. He turned white as a ghost. You could tell instantly, he's like, oh my God, what did I do? It's like a Ron Burgundy moment. He read it. He knew he fucked up. He's been super apologetic, like in shambles, basically. And I, I think anybody who watched the clip was like, there's no way he meant to do that. He's just not the brightest bulb to ever come down the pipe. And he just screwed up, and he knew he screwed up. And there was no hatred behind it, no nothing. Still awful, but no still awful what's awful about that you know i hate this whole like tiptoe politically correct around the n-word thing when everybody and their mother is using it in rap songs and they're throwing it around so frivolously towards other people i don't care i don't think this is going to be the reclaiming of the n-word by white people and white people are going to suddenly start running around saying the n-word what i do think though is that you should not be fired from your job if you are saying the n-word in the context of a rap song it makes no sense to me you don't get to gatekeep language because of its historical significance, especially when you've repackaged the word and you're throwing it around using it for other people. So a white guy says the N word in a rap song and he gets fired from his job. Are you kidding me? There should be no barrier around that sort of language. And it just is ridiculous for me to hear this story that you can get fired for saying the, a word in a rap song. Not my wildest dreams that I think I'd be sitting here being like, we had to fire Ben Mintz. Uh, Penn felt differently. Penn felt differently, and I'm stunned by it, and I've been fighting tooth and nail, as has Erica, as has Dan, to keep Ben and say this is the wrong decision. But Penn operates in a world that we don't operate in. It. They are highly regulated by the government, they're issued licenses for gambling that just as easily as they're issued, they can be pulled back. And for anybody mm. who has followed any of the states and Penn trying to get legalized and things like that, one thing's clear. A lot of people hate my guts. Pause. You know what? What? One thing is clear to me. One thing is clear to me is there's not a black person behind the firing of this guy. And let me explain why. Because if you go on the street and you ask a bunch of black people, do you care if a white person says the N-word? I mean, almost unanimously, I think the answer you're going to get is as long as it's not towards me, as long as you're not calling me an N-word. And there's actually a video of this white guy going around and asking black people, like, do you care if a white person says the N-word? How do you feel about the N-word? And they literally just saying, as long as it's not about me. So I'm just confused as to where the outrage came from uh, in this instance of this guy accidentally saying the N-word that led to his, his termination. I want to place my bets, since we're talking about gambling anyways, that a black person did not bring about the complaint that, that led to this man's firing. And just by and large, I feel like we got a white leftist behind this because they're the ones who are so ultra sensitive about the word when black people are saying, yo, as long as you don't call me that, we're not going to have a problem. They fucking hate me. They hate Barstool. And they look for any lever, any excuse, anything to cause problems for us and pull the licenses. Um, Penn is convinced and they've been very clear, Penn, since they took over. It's a zero tolerance policy moving forward. You can't do stuff like this. And really, stuff you haven't like had what? an incident like this since they've taken over. And they believe- We used to say the N-word all the time, but we haven't had an incident like this since they've bought us out, you know? <laughs> oh my That's gosh. actually true. There's video of, of Portnoy saying the N-word that was floating around Twitter recently, or like a few years ago, like 2016, I think, uh, uh, was when it was dated. And so it's just kind of ironic that this has come full circle. But I wonder in what context he was using it. it was Probably a similar one, honestly. Yeah, I mean, I think- most white people who who say the N word would probably be using it in the context of a, of a rap song and not calling somebody a hard R N word. Eve, there's a legitimate chance lots of the states would pull their licenses because of this. 
Um, Penn's a billion dollar company, multi-billion dollar company. Without their licenses, they are a zero dollar company. Investors, families, employees, thousands of people, they feel it's their job to protect all of this. And the only answer is to fire Ben Mintz. Pause. Okay. Now I recognize Dave Portnoy probably doesn't have much say in uh, what is going on in the termination of this guy because, you know, he, he sold Barstool Sports to this uh, larger entity, it seems. Uh, but people have been pissed. Uh, this is Penn Entertainment. Uh, their stock has been dropping. Uh, uh, Dave Portnoy tweeted out, there he is. That's uh, Mincy, which I guess is his way of uh, ushering this man into martyrdom after he's been terminated from his job for doing absolutely nothing. And I want to put that absolutely nothing. No, like, oh, it's, I, we know it's horrible and you shouldn't have said it, but it was an accident. No, he didn't do anything wrong. There's no accident. There's no infraction here. He didn't do anything. And I just find it hard to believe that, like, some guy saying the N-word on some small podcast that is associated with Barstool is going to get their billion-dollar licenses snatched from them as a, as a gambling entity. Just highly, highly doubt it. And even this article here uh, from Outkick, it uh, sort of expresses somewhere that that might even be uh, an infraction against or infringement on the First Amendment. Uh, so it wouldn't make sense for them to to lose their license here. The term free speech gets thrown around a lot and is frankly often misapplied. It says employers can fire employees over speech, right? The First Amendment. The First Amendment protects speech from government retaliation, which is what they were scared of. They're saying, we're, we think we're going to get government retaliation because you said the N-word on this obscure podcast, which would be protected by the First Amendment. So it's fine that they right. fired him right. The next sentence there says, but if state governments pulled gambling licenses because of something said on a barstool show, that would feel like a clear violation of the First Amendment. Right, so. right. So he can't go and sue them and say, you can't fire me for saying the N-word, of course, because they can fire him for saying the N-word on uh, this podcast. But their reasoning behind it, saying, oh, we're, we're scared of government retaliation, that they're going to pull all of our licenses because of one utterance on a podcast, smells like BS to me. It so really if it's does. not that, if that's not the motivation, then what is, you know, if they're not genuinely worried about the uh, their licenses being revoked, is the smoke-filled rooms at Penn just filled with these woke ideologues? Is it ESG scores that they're worried about? Uh, like, why would they be so in intent on firing him for this innocuous offense? Which, by the way, 91% of you, it's been go going down slightly, but we did a, a poll in the chat. 91% um, of you agree that a, a white person saying the N-word in quoting rap lyrics is not a fireable offense. So it's common sense dictates that, you know, this would not be something that is worth firing someone over, yet Penn is doing it. So I guess the question is, why, if it's not the revo revocation of their license that they're worried about? Right. I'm thinking like a disgruntled employee complaining about it or something like that, and they're just like lobbying for this guy to get fired. Or maybe they're like, we don't need his podcast and we're spending too much money here. Let's use this as an excuse to get rid of this thing that we're we're funding. All, I don't know. Uh, this is just yeah. speculation. Speculation. I, put, we're, we're I will say, though, like, you'd think they would they would look at the situation that we just saw with Bud Light and, hey, we're Barstool is a brand that's very much known for F. F you, F the man, we don't care. We're going to not be politically correct. We're going to call it like it is. It's the brand of the common man, Barstool. You're sitting at a Barstool next to the guy at the bar that you're having that kind of irreverent sort of conversation. And if 91% of, of people, uh, at least for our our you know subjective or poll sample here, right. uh, are saying, but if 91% of people agree that this is a silly, bad decision, um, then even from a financial standpoint, like you, you saw the stock, it's right. tanking. Like it's not, it's not even in their financial interest to do that. And the same, same logic at play with Bud Light's partnership with Dylan Mulvaney. It's like, what is motivating you people to do this crazy stuff that seems to overlap with this, uh, you know, woke sensitivities, uh, when like, just don't, don't stick your hands in the, the, the parts of the marketplace that are, governed by common sense people, not even necessarily conservative right-leaning people, but just common sense people. If you're going to try to impose all these crazy, uh, hypersensitive norms onto, onto them, because what do you think is going to happen? They're going to 
your stock's going to tank and right. they're going to not, not want to participate in your brand. Maybe it's delusion. Maybe they truly think the utterance of the N-word on a podcast is like the worst thing you can possibly do because they've been brainwashed into thinking that it's the worst thing that you could possibly do. Maybe they do truly believe that this is a win for justice, terminating this guy's in employment and uh, I guess rendering him in incapable of bringing in an income from this place anymore. Just crazy. <laughs> Wild that you could get fired uh, for, for saying something like that. Just unbelievable. I was going to show you the clip, but I don't know if it will demonetize our YouTube channel uh, for just even playing the clip of him saying this. He's quite literally just like reading off rap lyrics and he says it and you can tell he like immediately stumbles like, oh, like I said that you can just see it register. Um, but yeah, and he was right to have uh, been worried about that utterance leaving his mouth because he's been terminated. So there we are. So stupid. Uh, and it's a clear indication that if you've been a long long time fan of Barstool Sports, that I guess due to being bought out by another company, they're no longer standing by any of the principles that they once stood for as as a company. And it's not necessarily to blame Dave Portnoy. I know people have been attacking him and he made this whole video on Twitter saying, you know, I made the company to sell the company. That's why people make companies. That's why they're entrepreneurs or whatever. And he seems to be not responsible for this happening and doesn't seem to have much sway over this guy being fired or not. But that's the situation. So uh, sucks for Ben Ben Mintz. Hopefully somebody else uh, snatches him up and they, they run with this narrative because now would be a great time for his career to stand up and, and talk about free speech because <laughs> that's ridiculous. Uh, speaking of free speech, I want to touch on this actress who has this quote that's now gone viral on Twitter, Evangeline Lilly, who you guys might have seen in Ant-Man alongside Paul Rudd. Uh, the quote here is, why are we only applauding masculinity in women and villainizing it in men? And why are we only applauding femininity in men and debasing it in women? I just want to give her a shout out for being one of the few people in Hollywood to espouse such of you. And she's hitting the nail on the head, right? We love a good masculine woman girl boss, much like you guys saw in the Peter Pan and Wendy review that you guys have been liking that we posted on the channel yesterday. We love a female girl boss boss, feminist icon, uh, but when men display their masculinity, oh, toxic, toxic, horrible, horrible. We need to, I don't know, breed it out of them, raise boys and girls the same, right? And now when men are feminine, uh, like, a, like a Dylan Mulvaney type or, you know, in, insert X name of transgender activists, we love it. We're applauding it. We're giving them campaigns. They're sponsored by, I don't know, Maybelline and Nike and Bud Light. <laughs> and, uh, and then when women do their normal thing, you know, you know, be mothers and, uh, you know, breastfeed their children, provide, nurture, take care of things. Uh, they're looked down upon or referred to as what? Birthing persons, chest feeders, uh, not women at all. Cis women. We just change we change the words. So when we do the thing that's natural to us and naturally makes us powerful, oh, who cares about that? But when a man does it, oh, applause. Do we have an applause button? Where's our applause button? There Ooh. we go. <laughs> I'm impressed Scott remembered which one it is. I know. I would have been struggling. <laughs> <laughs> so shout out to Evangeline Lilly for, yeah, for awesome. saying that out loud. I wish I have the video of her saying it. It's just this quote in this magazine. Yeah, uh, she was what she was in Lost, and uh, I think one of the Hobbit the Hobbit movies. So uh, it's refreshing, you know. I think I've also saw um, during the COVID craziness, she was outspoken against vax mandates and other stuff like that. Maybe from kind of a more of a kooky hippie type of place, but sure. hey, we'll take it, man. It's uh, people kind of eye roll sometimes when uh, oh, a celebrity said something that you know bucks the narrative a little bit. Let's all freak out and act like they're the greatest person ever. But you know what? I love it. And she worded that very well. And I'm going to give credit where credit's due. It's a, it's a courageous thing to say the truth. Um, and we've seen plenty of actors get canceled like Gina Carano for saying, you know, speaking their minds and uh, to, to do it. It's an act of courage and to do it so articulately, uh, she, she, you know, major props. Well, she will be fired soon <laughs> for looking at the Barstool yeah. sports story. If there's any <laughs> and there goes her career. <laughs> right. You'll never see her in a movie again. So this is actually yeah. a bon voyage for Evangeline Lilly. <laughs> well, I hope not. I hope not. I hope people stay by her side and that she's built enough of a name for herself to uh, to stick around after saying something like this. But sometimes we are not blessed in that way. I think we're going to get into uh, Super Chats for the day. Um, Alrighty, Rue. Let's yeah. pull them up. Let's do that. 
By the way, it looks like we are partially demonetized today, I think, because we have George Floyd in the title. Okay, so, that's fine. Thanks a lot, YouTube. Always cool. It could have been the Michael Jackson uh, lyrics or music as well. Yeah, I guess it could have been copyright. Yeah. We'll find out. Maybe this is true. We'll get to the bottom of this. Um. Oh, my gosh. Okay, here we go. Uh, so fair few of you guys today. We appreciate it. <laughs> um. First one, Robert Gearing says, keep up the great reporting. So thank you, thank Robert. You. Um, Mel says, that's horrible. I love your videos. I guess referring to the situation. Yes. Um, Gary says, it only takes 10 seconds for someone to pass out. Then you have to hold longer for them to die. If this guy was ex-military, he definitely should have known that. Yeah, I think there was a firsthand account of a guy saying that he kept coming back in i into consciousness i guess and like flailing around and that from his point of view it seemed like he was awake and that he was responding to the stuff around him so it's going to be hard to know uh you're just probably just going to have eyewitness accounts on on what happened there i also like i said i find it kind of hard to believe that with three men there you guys couldn't subdue him without having the, th the arm around the neck for that amount of time yeah, I feel like that's the part of it where you just kind of have to let the investigation take place. Let's let all the facts come out. Let them get all the testimony from all the witnesses and actually, you know, figure out what happened there. Like, was there a toxicology report that's relevant? Like, who knows? Um, yeah. But it's a little too early to jump on on anything um, too strongly, I think. Right. But anyway, Moondoggy says, I'm so tired of crazy homeless people running around in New York, stabbing people and causing violence. One of them effed around and found out and wanted to be treated like a pure victim, but the citizens have to deal with it. Yeah, it's a, there's a lot of that stuff going on. I mean, I've heard of people getting stabbed here in LA, just minding their own business. Some guy, uh, like a former race car driver, I think a NASCAR driver was stabbed here in LA, uh, just pumping gas. Uh, and just unbelievable, the sort of, stuff that you see uh, day in and day out like it does not phase me anymore to see like a naked man just walking down the street uh here in los angeles it happens more often than uh the government officials here are are willing to admit and sometimes i just remember i woke up in tennessee this morning and uh <laughs> none of that nice breath of that you know not weed it's gross air <laughs> right right taylor uh, sat on his front sorry, porch guys. this morning i woke up walked out the front steps and there was a man sleeping right outside my apartment yeah oh, lovely so we've installed a ring camera to say the very very least so you can see Smart. them sleep yep so i can see them before they break into my apartment where i don't have any stand yeah. your ground laws uh and can't do anything about it so at least we'll have like a five second warning I'm glad I did not have a ring camera when I found uh, human feces on my doorstep when I was in Santa Monica. <laughs> that uh, that would have not Horrible. been a video I'd like to see. Horrible. <laughs> uh, Kate Svensson says, I'm happy to be here from the beginning. Uh, oh. I feel it was necessary to subdue Mr. Neely to ensure the safety of other passioners and a shame that he did not survive. I'm sure it was unintentional. That's a reasonable yeah. take. Yeah, I would agree with that. I would. Uh, nothing about this seems like an intentional. I don't think anybody wakes up and is like, you know what? Let's take a life today. That would be fun. So, yeah. Thank you for that, Kate. Uh, Hi Q says, of course, history repeats itself because liberals do not learn from it. They cancel it. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. You have to make the connection between your beliefs and the outcome of your beliefs. And people are not making the connection. <sighs> yeah, and it's even recent history. I mean, 90s New York City crime went down. Uh, precipitously because of policies that were implemented and now it's back up. So, right. Uh, Over Easy Egg says, did you hear, ever hear that, that BLM song, The Bigger Picture by Little Baby in 2020, nominated for Song of the Year, but lost to WAP SMH? I have uh, not Would love to that. hear you break down and talk about the lyrics of that song. <sighs> I've not heard that song. Huh. Um, I'll have to look into that. What is it called? The Bigger Picture by Lil Baby. I bet it's going to be moving. I'll have to... The fact oh, that I one of the biggest it. rappers is called Lil Baby Lil is Baby. Kind of funny to me. There's the fists. I see Black Lives Matter. I'll check this out. We'll see if it's anything interesting. Uh, Kate, again, says our mental health system is a disgrace. Yeah. 
I mean, that's, I mean. It's something it, left and right can agree on, I think, these days. Right, right. And that's why I think in, in uh, Michael Schellenberger's book where he talks about it, his is like a state sanctioned and, you know, paid for uh, mental health care and treatment for people who are dealing with any sort of mental illness and drug abuse and all that stuff, which is maybe where the uh, the great schism happens is people don't want to have the state pay for that. But at this point, <laughs> At least in California, New York. I mean, I'm open. I'm open to it. If it works, it works. Uh, yeah. I mean, after reading his book and what, um, following him for a little while, I'm like, I I haven't seen a better plan right. than what he's proposed. Right. So um, Susan Vasquez says, I'm an ER nurse and a mentally ill individual drove his car through our front door to harm security. We honored the integrity of the mentally ill while preserving our safety and mitigating damage. Safety first, though. Yep. Exactly. You can take care of a situation and still feel bad for the person who is like perpetuating the violence in that instance. I don't think anybody's looking at this story and going, you know, what, like, I don't care at all. Don't feel bad for, for Jordan Neely. And if they are, I think it's a lack of nuance on the part of like people. I don't think people really wake up and want to be in his position either. Even with the 44 arrests and all this different stuff, like I, I agree that's bad and that it shows a long list of, of criminal history, but I don't think people wake up and they're like, you know what, this is what I want to do with my life and this is what I want to be. And like, I think that just the nuance needs to be acknowledged there that you can say this is a horrible situation for everybody involved, everybody. Harry McPherson says, hey, guys, I love watching your videos and listening to your honest discourse around social issues. Would you consider delving into the birth gap? Check out Stephen J. Shaw if you're not familiar. I am not familiar. You guys always the give me different gap. things. Is that to like birth up. rates in different countries? Is it births across races? I'm curious. Like people concerned with the birth we'll rate, to look birth rate decline around the world and its impact on mm. our personal lives. I'm going to look it up. I know that's a concern of Elon Musk and Nick Cannon. But yeah, much. I haven't looked into it enough to uh, see if it's like has is, is validated in any way. We shall see. Um, Alex Santeas, this question is for Wednesday's show. The pearl clip you played was accurate. Women compete for the best guy. That's why that girl on the whatever podcast said, I hope my guy can cheat. Women don't usually admit this because it makes them look bad. Yeah, I don't know. I don't see. I don't see that to be true. I know the the pearl clip. I think we're referencing is that women want a man with experience, right? And that yep. is slept around. I think she says specifically that is that is slept around. I think there are certainly women who are like that. Do I think it's the majority of women? Probably not. Like I've never heard a woman say he's such a great guy. Just wish he'd been with more women. <laughs> ever in my life, I've never heard that ever. Now, I've heard maybe I wish he was more confident or, you know, like I wish he was like less awkward, things like that. Yeah, but I've never heard I wish there was more previous to me. <laughs> but I get it that, you know, there's a few men who are getting all this attention from from women. So naturally, they're going to take the opportunity to sleep with women. I'm just saying that the man who doesn't take the opportunity uh, might have, you know, just better standing in my eyes. Yeah, I wonder. I wonder if uh, that, I wonder if that ahead, question Scott. also like is the person saying like, or maybe he's he's thinking Pearly was saying like, oh guys or girls want guys who could cheat but don't. Maybe that was a uh, the interpretation he took from it. I don't know. Maybe I could but, see that. Maybe. I could see that. I could see women wanting a man who's desirable, but do you want him to act on the desire? Yeah, his his own desirability. That's the thing. And then there's also a conflation of like experience because you've had the reps and the numbers right. versus like just being experienced and like having talent, you know, there's right. a difference. There. There's a big like, difference. There's a big difference. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. We could maybe we could do a whole, we could probably do a whole video on that. Uh, there's a lot to, uh, there's some down. crazy d ideas about dating going around these days. Uh, <laughs> each, each day I'm like, man, I'm glad I'm out uh, the game and married now. Right. Um, be a, be a Dean says, don't fire me because I posted lyrics with the word 10 years ago. Yeah. We will not. We, we, we won't. We, we personally might. have no say in that. Pen might. Yeah, <laughs> pen, pen will fire you. <laughs> <laughs> and Portnoy will watch. But <laughs> uh, RJ Builds PCs says, I find it hard to believe that that's why he was fired. There's something else that we're not being told, obviously. Love the stream. Right. It could be. This is at least the public story that we're getting. I mean, I, there seems to be other things at play. 
that's why I'm like, what's the motivation? Is it like, I, I don't understand because you know it's going to harm you. It's just strange to me. Right. Yeah. I, um, I, I think ahead, my speculation would be this is obviously, I'm just speculating here, um, mm-hmm. but it would be that maybe Penn is trying to uh, gain a little bit more social credit by doing this because they've been going through the ringer being, you know, the ones who purchased Barstool and Barstool, as you guys have mentioned, like Dave sticking up for, you know, unvaccinated people and so on and so forth you right. know like maybe that's just them they're making this decision in order to gain some social capital back oh so like know. here's our little like yeah. drop in the leftist bucket for you guys maybe yeah. who knows they gotta boost that esg score yeah. you know we'll never I'm know sure vanguard probably owns a good chunk of them or or blackrock <laughs> and they gotta make them happy uh, who knows that seems to be the way of the world these days uh, Brandon Reynolds says, I've got a funny story about that. I said it once at my last job. I was the only white guy on the line and they all froze. And then they all started laughing and high-fiving me. They had zero problem with me saying it. One even said, my N, what LOL. Did, that, there you go. See? You know, it's a wholesome story. Sometimes when you cross the boundaries, <laughs> you are rewarded. <laughs> and other times you're punched in the face. So Yeah, this is uh, true. That's walk the tightrope. Tight rope, yeah. <laughs> See what happens there. Dicks and butts. There you are. It's white women, Mamala. It's always white women. Oh, yeah. In the reference to the N-word thing. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you know, the the first campus I ever went to, I was protested by a bunch of white women calling me racist. So Mm -hmm. this is how it goes. This is, I don't know why it is that way. I kind of know why it is that way, but that's a video for another day. (laughs) Uh, Jeremy says, Amla, do you believe in gay marriage as a non-Christian? And how is your relationship with Candace Owens? And do you agree with her turning on DeSantis? <laughs> okay. I don't know. Let me, let me address really those. Like, just trying to throw you in the fire there. The controversy, man. There. Um, the last question, I don't know about Candace and DeSantis. I haven't seen anything in regard to that. So I don't really feel any type of way about it. We don't really talk about presidential endorsements or anything like that on this show. So I couldn't care less. Uh, what is my relationship with Candace? say acquaintances we run into each other every now and then in the work that we do and uh, are friendly what was the last thing what is my opinion on gay marriage i yeah. don't yeah i don't care uh you sh- people can get married to who they want to get married to and yeah i'm not motivated as by religion as you said so yeah, i don't care there you go jeremy you tried Just but she's floyd mayweather bobbing and weaving Dodging are you kidding all of your <laughs> controversy <laughs> uh jason jordan and so it looks like some Japanese characters there. I don't Very can't read cool. those. Sorry. Says, uh, love the channel. Just found it. No, Jordan Neely isn't the new George Floyd. One of the witnesses said the hold wasn't being applied the whole time. So there you go. We need like, all the facts and on, emerge. Off and on and off and on. Yeah, yeah I'll be, we'll see what happens. I'll, I'll be interested to see how they investigate this or how they get down to uh, get down to the bottom of this one. Yeah. A uh, fallen artist says 28 year old mom of a year and a half old son grew up with a lib mind, but changed to cons in adulthood, uh, conservative in adulthood. Mm-hmm. I value tradition a lot. It seems love your videos. Oh, thank you so much. And yeah, I'm happy for you and your mind opening experience. I think it happens to, uh, it's to a lot of us, <laughs> especially, especially with motherhood. Age. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say, take especially. on responsibilities. Yeah. <clears throat> Um, Robert Gearing again says, Robert again, have a good night. Thank you, Robert. Thank have you. Have a great Friday <laughs> weekend. Nicodemus, 1984. Welcome back. I recognize you. Um, it, I might be completely wrong, but am I the only one who feels a Pam Grier vibe with your 70s style jacket? Great show as usual, by the way. Pam, who's who's this? I, I Pam. This is, I'm out of my depth here. Gr- How do you spell it? Oh, Grier. G-R-I-E-R. American actress. I'll take it. I've never seen, I don't recognize her, but she's cute. So I'll take it. Thank you. <laughs> there you go. You could have worn that to the Met Gala. <laughs> <laughs> um, Cash Cow says, if he had killed a civilian, would there be a protest? If, if what? If he had killed a civilian, will there be a protest? I'm not sure I what don't... that's in reference to. As a yeah, civilian Jordan was had killed. killed a civilian? Oh, uh, maybe that's what they mean. Uh, and then, no, absolutely not. There would not have been a protest. It's always hush when the narrative does not fit. Yeah, I looked it up. There was 10 subway murders in uh, 2022 in New York City. That's scary. And uh, it's a 30-year high, and subway crime was up 68% from April 2022 uh, since 2021. Didn't some guy go so, and shoot up a subway? 
uh, like a subway stop? Surprise I don't remember. But yeah, we don't talk about those victims. Nope. It's a salient point. Um, Azalea says, as a black person, I feel like I'm truly going insane with all this. As long as you aren't using that word in reference to me, I don't care. I don't have ownership over what you can or can't say. Thank you. Thank you That's for Amala reiterating energy my right point. There. That is Amala energy, and I love it, and it is so true. <laughs> Who cares? I don't. If you have enough energy to worry about what other people are saying, where'd you get your energy from? Okay, because I need to figure that out. I wish I had that much energy. Uh, Willie Pilly says, "Hey Amala, what will your advice be? What will be your advice on debating someone without being too passionate about the subject?" Um. I think I just always just put in my brain right now, like what this person thinks to, should not ultimately affect me that much in life. And if you go into the debate with that mindset, there's no reason to get like overly impassioned over something that somebody else thinks. Like our thoughts come and go and they constantly shift and change. So even if somebody is saying something that's like to you is completely insane, just be like, you know what? You're on your own personal journey with that thought. Uh, thoughts do come and go. You're holding that right now. I'm listening to it. I am going insane. But just breathe through it and be like, you know, it doesn't affect you that much to have this debate in that moment. I think people get emotional because they think it like affects them so much and it really doesn't at the end of the day. Yeah. Um, Gary again says poop on your doorstep. Do you live near Amber Heard? LOL. <laughs> <laughs> No, not, not a far less attractive person, I think, did that to Taylor's doorstep. <laughs> uh, Joe W. I mean, I don't have the ring footage, so who knows? <laughs> who but, knows? Maybe uh, it was Amber Heard. <laughs> Same city, I guess. <laughs> uh, Joe W. says, hi, Amala. Apropos black girl who doesn't, who don't trust whites, I will said to check history of Polish legions send at Napoleon era to Hawaii quite freedom fighters white poles said with hawaiians and fight back french i i'm confused <laughs> it ends with the the word i so that was kind of difficult to piece together i will say that was very difficult to piece together also you guys are letting me know that pam greer is foxy brown and i take that as a very big compliment thank you i still don't know who foxy brown is but the the that sounds afro. nice mm. it's okay mm. don't worry about it scott do you know who foxy brown is do you guys want yeah, a photo? I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm looking at the photos here, so I'm cheating a little bit. Oh, okay. so, <laughs> here <laughs> yeah, here we go. See? You see it, Taylor? She's foxy and yeah. she's brown. Okay. Yeah. There you go. I see you. I see you. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, Joe, thank you for the super chat. I'm sorry we weren't quite able to piece that one together. Um, Alex again says, but women want their guy to be best at this and that, etc. And thanks, God, but no, didn't mean that. Women want the best guy because that means they have a winner and other girls want, want him to, want him too. Right. But mm. I think we're conflating being the best guy with having slept with a lot of women. That's the thing. Yeah. That, Pearl says in the video, like, you want somebody experienced who slept with a lot of women. You can be the best guy and have slept with nobody and just have, you know, maybe a bunch of women knocking down your door trying to get to you, but uh, unsuccessful. Yeah, since when are we calling F boys the best guy? Like, right. <laughs> since when? This our stereotypes got inverted at some point there. I'm not sure how that happened. It's true. Um Halcyon Song says nothing but gives super chat. Thank you for that. Miles Lifting says, Love your content. Big love from the UK. Thank you. Right British pounds given. <laughs> um Halcyon again says, My note failed to show again. Open question is is IR porn helping with racism or fueling it? Oh, inter interracial, I think. Uh, is interracial porn, porn helping with racism or fueling it? Not a supporter of porn personally. You know, I that's, don't that's know the question. numbers on that. <laughs> I don't know. Never considered this one. I imagine it would help uh, if I, I guess. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> like, <laughs> I have to really think about this. Is interracial porn helping with racism or hurting it? I imagine in the grand scheme of things, uh, it's helping. 
<laughs> now, now people uh, are gonna like take that out of context like yeah. they did with Dennis's oh, yeah. statements and it's gonna, gonna yep. become a whole drama and it's gonna be a New York Times article or New York Post tomorrow. Um, mm-hmm. No, luckily I don't have any strong stances on the issue so I can say whatever Amla I Benobi want. Amla proposes the solution to racism is more interracial. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> yeah, I But in all seriousness, I have seen, have you seen those like statistics um, where they used to ask people like back, you know, in the 80s, 90s, even of their approval of interracial marriage. And it's gone, um, it's, it's gone up precipitously since then. So like nowadays, inter- the approval rate for interracial marriage is like n- in the high 90s. And it's just a testament to like, the racism isn't as big a deal, right. as uh, people make it out to be embrace relations are improving despite the narratives of the media. So Very true. we'll pivot off of your, uh, my your topic and uh, make a, an actual <laughs> hey, point about it. That's... Twist my arm. That's my answer. Uh, we got a $50 super chat from Floyd oh, nice. Bassins. We'll read that right now. Response from Wednesday uh, for Wednesday's video. I could date anyone with moral values similar to Taylor's and other Christians. However, I'm socially declined because I prefer to listen to people and usually don't talk much. Oh, what do you think I could do? Okay, so he wants to date somebody with Taylor slash Christian values and uh, is getting declined because he doesn't talk much. Hmm. Prefers, Wait, so this is Flynn, a, Flynn a f- female? I think or, he's a man. Yeah, it sounds okay. like he's a guy. Well, if you're looking for Christian values, I'd recommend going to church, getting involved, serving in some capacity. That's a great way to meet people, even if you're shy or socially awkward, because you have a function to perform and you can focus on that. And you just naturally build relationships around that. Um, you can check out there's small groups or social groups um, around church that you can get involved in. Um, so those, that's that's where I'd start, Um at least if you're looking for a pool of people with a particular set of values, you know, yeah. I guess that's my, the best advice I can give. I met this girl who said there was like some app called like group something that you can get on and you can just put in the things that you're interested in. And in whatever city you're at, it will group you with people who are like meeting over those interests. I think like she in particular was doing like black girls who love to hike and she found a group <laughs> of black girls who love to hike so you could find some stuff very specific on these little like group things. you could probably even find a group of introverts yeah be like uh hang out with introverts i did that when i moved to la i that's how i found my volleyball community or it was you know it wasn't like an instant thing but it got my foot in the door with a certain group and then that led to more opportunities to meet people and earn my street cred um, and uh, eventually just had an awesome, awesome volleyball community um, by the end of it. So, you know, it takes a little bit of persistence sometimes to, to get into, I'm experiencing that again now because I moved to Nashville and I'm trying to find people to play with and I'm having to start at the bottom. Right. Um, but, you know, but, but that's also not like a values base, you know, it's a, it's a crapshoot as to whether you're going to connect with people who share your values and just like hobby based things. Um, right. So if you want explicitly based on values, I'd say a church group. You could try our Discord. Maybe somebody lives near you can hang out, meet oh, up. Yeah, never know. I'd love to. What if there was an unapologetic Discord relationship that happened? What if we did How speed dating sessions <laughs> right? through Discord? That'd uh, be a video. And, by the way, the app is called Meetup, I think. So. Oh, that's the one I used. Yeah, Meetup. Yeah. Yeah. So there you go. Um, let's see, where were we? Cease Law says, Hey, Amala, just wanted to say as a former leftist myself that I appreciate your content. You are a class act and have such an intelligent mind. Oh, and I guess Taylor and Scott are cool too. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I feel like that happens really frequently it on does. the stream. It's probably a running joke. Like a, oh, yeah, I guess so. It's a so. running joke at this point. <laughs> uh, Pearl, which I don't think is pearly after your comments a minute ago, but uh, no, hey. Pearl said, just gives five dollars. No, thank you. Uh, comment there. Um, Jeremy says, Amala, do you agree with Candace Owens on everything? What is your opinion on the Stephen Crowder thing? Do you agree he's an ab- abuser according to uh, according your bestie? According to my bestie, I where where is this idea that Candace and I are besties? Um, anyways, not besties. Like I said, acquaintances. Um, what is what's the question? Do I agree with her on Stephen Crowder, or do I agree with her on everything? No, <laughs> I yeah, don't agree with on anybody. Everything. I don't agree with anybody on everything. <laughs> um, on on Stephen Crowder, I mean, I honestly have not given his whole story uh much airtime. I will say that I don't think you can 
gauge anybody's long term relationship on the basis of of one video. And that's not to exonerate him from what was stated in that video, because I don't think it's acceptable. Uh, But I don't have any strong opinions on somebody else's relationship that has literally nothing to do with me. So that's where my stance is going to going to stay. Y'all handle that in divorce court. None of my business. Keep the drama on Judge Judy. Yeah, uh, the That Delia girl says, glad you covered the story on Neely. First full podcast. Love your channel. As a white person, I never felt comfortable saying N-word, but my sis does. Right. <laughs> Just go. call her out, man. You know, and it's a thing like, it's not something that you should like want to feel comfortable with, uh, but if black people or if anybody wants other people to stop saying it, then encourage all people to stop saying it. It's not a word that one race gets to own. Like if you're uncomfortable with the word, then you should be uncomfortable when anybody uses it. Jen says, my mom has always said when it comes to insults, is it true? No. Then why get mad? If it is, then why get mad? I've always lived by that. Exactly. Mm. That's why if if people get super defensive, sometimes it's like, okay, she must have struck a chord. Uh, Lady Maverick 823 sent a $50 super chat, so we'll read immediately. High value men and vice versa will value uh, women slash partners on the content of their character and will not care about the number. That being said, Pearl's take sounded like it was coming from a personal place and her experience and still off the mark. Yeah, it just depends on like what we call like high value men. I think the the uh, definition of high value man is getting twisted and turned and all this stuff. To me, a high value man is a man who has high values uh, and is going to use those values in pursuit of a relationship with you, which that can be men with high numbers. It can be men with low numbers. It doesn't really matter. Um, but yeah, I just don't this like hard and fast rule of like women want men with more experience with all these partners and all this stuff. I just think it's just not it's no, it's not a nuanced take. And maybe to be fair to Pearl a little bit, I think she was saying that modern women think a certain way. So maybe that wasn't necessarily saying that that's how she sees it, but but that is like an attitude that's out there. So Um, Dixon Butts again says, I don't like Subway sandwiches either, but not so much as to murder. It's a joke about that happening on the subway, I think. Oh, (laughs) Got it. I thought I was thinking like Jesse Smollett, you know, how he had a subway right. uh, a sandwich right. allegedly. Yeah. When the, uh, yeah. Anyways. <laughs> Didn't, I, sorry. I just like reading your name. So thanks for <laughs> thanks for that. Uh, Teton Sally says people want to defund police and have community policing, which I am for hashtag and cap, uh, but don't want how it goes. SJWs need to figure out what they want. Yeah, I'm just saying, yeah, this is what community policing looks like. I know they think it's going to be like some social work uh, looking type infrastructure uh, and how people deal with one another. But that is community policing. It's people going way out over their skis to quell a situation that they're wholly untrained and unprepared for. Yeah. Um, Big spots again. Black girls who left to hike. Is that some sort of euphemism? For what? <laughs> I don't want to know. Getting wild I don't know. Y'all, today. y'all are getting wild in the chat today. I don't know. All I know is it's a group of black girls who are going on hikes on the weekends, um, which would personally not be for me because I don't understand why you would want to separate that on the basis of race. But to each their own, Charlize their own. Shine, sign up for whatever group you want to go to. Uh, Lynn Vessens again says, why would a body count be important? Also, what is a body count anyway? I'm too innocent for this. Body count is how many people you have slept with. Um, Hopefully you're not too young for that explanation. And you're just an innocent, like, 20-something year old. (laughs) I hope. Uh, But why would it be important? Oh, why would it be important? Um, Well, some people would say that the more people you slept with, the less likely they would be to date you just because it speaks to where your values lie or something like that. And just, you know, generally something people might want to know in a relationship. Yeah. Um, yep. And I answer. think, are we caught <laughs> up there? Oh, Savrix. Y'all are more intelligent than I had to be at your age. Many people can't understand some of the things I've said to you. You're bright minded. I'm like. Savrix is the one with the deep philosophical uh, super chats all the yes, time. Yes, so, yes. We love yeah, Savrix. It's, it's always um, a challenge. Yeah, I'm always like, I always get called kind of like, oh, you're so smart for your age. I'm like, I wonder when that goes, what, what age does that go away where people start, start being un- 
unimpressed <laughs> by, <laughs> by whatever that age is i've hit it <laughs> <laughs> uh, another one from moon doggy says adams started an outreach program when he came in because people voted him to be tough on crime the turnout rate for this outreach is low uh, people don't want to deal with the problems Okay, so he started an outreach program. I don't know what that what what an outreach program consists of. I wonder what that even means. I've seen different like outreach programs where it's like social workers and uh, like community uh, events and stuff like that, trying to get build relationships and get people in structured like you know shelters and education and all this stuff. And I think it's a great thing to do when you couple it with <laughs> law and order enforcement yeah, yeah like there needs it to reminds be me of uh when the police that we went on the ride along with in um in with the lapd um told us that hey you can have all the community programs that you want but if there's not a baseline level of safety in the community then those people aren't even safe like going door to door and engaging with people or doing what what they're trying to do and so they have to go hand in hand and also I love hearing about outreach programs and it's it's nice to hear that Adam started one but at the same time you we just read the stats on how uh crime has increased in yeah. just the last year in the subways and stuff uh in New York City so we have to couple that like Amla said with greater law enforcement or these uh programs that we're doing if they're effective, then they should be changing the outcomes. And if they're not changing the outcomes, then we either need to broaden the scale at which they're being implemented or change the uh, our approach, or there's another missing variable. And, and I would suspect that that would be uh, enforcement. Right. Last I one. I think from, that's it. Oh, we have one. one from Flynn. It says, I'm 20. Okay. Mm. So good. I gave a solid answer okay. for a year. <laughs> it's one appropriate. Question. You're also, armed with knowledge. Flynn, you probably want to go. I said an introvert's meetup place. You'd probably want to go to an extrovert meetup, right? Because then you don't have to worry about talking. They'll just talk for you. <laughs> and all you, and then you can practice your active listening. Uh, and, you know, extroverts will never, you know, be, you know, let you be embarrassed. Are y'all's uh, partners more introverted or extroverted than you? Uh, I don't even know. Yeah. Probably mine is the exact same as me, probably. Really? I'd say the exact same. Yeah, mine's pretty equivalent as well, but it also depends on the scenario and situation that we're in and who we're around and the the vibe and stuff like that. But um, oh, that's one, fair. one thing I would say is to, uh, to this person is also like you can go ahead and be the one to ask the questions. So you're not the one giving all of the talking points or answering all the questions yourself. Like get to know the person by you being the one posing the questions too. Right. And then you can start into a deeper relationship understanding them. So that you could then also open up yourself. Be an interviewer of sorts. Yeah. Mm. Well, well, Taylor, your wife's more introverted, right? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, but it, and ironically, like I consider myself an introvert. Like my little personality thing is like INTJ mm -hmm. uh, of the Myers Briggs or whatever. Uh, but I'm kind of in the middle on that. But it's like being with an introvert, I feel like makes me more extroverted because by my extrovert itch doesn't get scratched as naturally, you know, right. so I'm like, so gotta I get out there, to, honey. I, yeah, I gotta hype <laughs> it up even more. So. That's so funny. <laughs> yeah, so maybe find your, uh, your, your, the yin to your yang. Mm -hmm. um, Alex has one more here. I think you missed one of my super chats, but Halo question for Taylor. What year did Halo 3 come out? Uh, is the whole crew going with you to Minneapolis? Um, oh, like, because oh, you're that? going to Minneapolis, you said, I am. Allah, right? Yeah, no, the yeah. whole crew's not I'm not going to be there, unfortunately. No. I was just up there a few weeks ago for, for uh, a funeral, actually, but um, it's always <laughs> otherwise great. Yeah, today. right. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, Halo 3 had to have been, what, like, 06, maybe? Scott, did you? I played two the most. I was going to say 07, 08. Yeah, maybe it was a little after, because, yeah, I was, 2006, I was still playing Halo it 2 It was at the time. September 25th, 2007. Let's go. Okay, you go. Scott, you got it. There we go. <laughs> yeah. I still play. I don't know if I'm comfortable giving out my gamer tag, but I still hop on uh, the new Halo every now and Why then. Why do you think um, you're going to track your house or something? <laughs> I mean, maybe they could. Yeah. I don't know. Y'all uh, message me or maybe I'll put on Discord. I'll put my gamer tag and we can, we can connect. But you yeah. have to be good. I don't want to just play with losers. <laughs> uh, we've got another message from Joe W. says, by the way, Amla, if you want to see some real shits, check Discord. Uh, D.R. Bauer Ayanda, a.k.a. the Polish black right wing disabled guy, pro-life activist, take care crew. OK, I'll have to check him out. 
interesting. You guys always throw in recommendations at me. It's hard to keep up. But I appreciate them because sometimes you like strike stuff that I'm like, oh, sh we need to make a video about this immediately. <laughs> uh, guys, that's our show for today. Hope uh, you feel more informed after watching it. We had different things to talk about today. We touched on the Jordan Neely story. I gave you my perspective on that. Uh, we also talked about Barstool and the firing of, uh, what's his name again? Ben Mince. Mince. Ben Mincy. Yeah. Ben Mincy. Uh, and uh, the hole that was left behind, as, as Dave Portnoy now says. Plus, we discussed Evangeline Lilly and her comments about masculinity and femininity. I hope you guys had a great time. Leave your comment down below. How do you feel about the Jordan Neely situation? What is your interpretation? Uh, does the guy who is responsible for choking him deserve to go to jail for this? I have a feeling that's where he is going to end up, given the circumstances of uh, this in counter let me know in the comments down below as always we encourage healthy debate please like subscribe click the notification bell to be notified every single time we're live that's monday wednesday friday 3 p.m pacific 6 p.m eastern plus we post videos every single day for you guys to watch and comment on and interact with each other and if you want to interact with each other outside of youtube sign up for our discord the link is in the description down below also you can get a newsletter from me that goes out uh, every week with a little blurb uh plus all the content that we put out throughout the week by signing up for my email slash newsletter also in the link in the description Guys, have a fantastic weekend. I'm going to have one. I'm going to a concert on Sunday with my bestie, Risa. And we're working on a second YouTube channel for you guys. So uh, you guys will be able to check that out hopefully sooner rather than later. And that's what I'll be doing this weekend. Drop your weekend plans in the comments down below. Bye, guys.